All right. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Congratulations on making it to Friday. Um, uh, it's, been, um, it's been quite a week. And our topic today <clears throat> is, um, is really connected uh, in many ways to almost everything we've been talking about this week. The, the theme of the week is shaping a, a global architecture in the fourth industrial revolution and what's tearing the old architecture down, um, rising and massive inequality around the world is, is playing a very big part in that. Um, so we have some big questions. Uh, what will it take to, to stop it, to reverse this uh, wave of uh, inequality? Will this fourth industrial revolution lead to more of it, more unemployment, more class warfare, more conflict, or harnessed differently? Will it lead to more equality and sustainability? And we have a, a terrific panel to discuss it today. Um, uh, Winnie Bianima, sitting next to me, is the executive director of Oxfam International, which issues the much discussed, uh, sometimes debated, um, and influential uh, report on inequality annually. She's also a powerful advocate for human rights and, and women's rights around the world. Uh, uh, Jane Goodall probably needs no introduction, uh, one of the uh, uh, most uh, famous and admired conservationists and advocates for animal welfare. Um, she's also been a force all over Davos this week with her uh, eloquent and powerful pleas for us to save our planet. And, and actually, Jane has another. We have a sixth panelist. <laughs> Mr. H. <laughs> Mr. H. Um, uh, Alicia Barsana Ibarra is the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. She's a biologist and uh, also an expert in sustainable development. And one of the topics uh, we want to talk about today is the connection between poverty, inequality, and sustainability. Uh, Rutger Bregman is a historian whose book, Utopia for Realists, sparked an international discussion about universal basic income. And uh, glad to have him. He even advocates for a 15-hour work week, which um, I'm, at this point in the week, very interested in. <laughs> um, and um, uh, Shamina Singh is the executive vice president of sustainability <coughs> at MasterCard and president of the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, focusing on financial inclusion. Um, before we uh, get started, my colleagues uh, at time, a few of whom are here today, um, prepared a 90-second video that lays out the context for our conversation today, um, goal being for us up here not to spend too much ad time admiring the problem. Uh, so we'll just uh, roll that, and then we'll, we'll go into some questions. No breaking news, these protests playing out on the streets of Paris, France. The British people want us to get on with delivering Brexit. As the gap between rich and poor gets wider, the costs of inequality are adding up, and it's forcing a conversation long overdue. Questions that haven't been asked, or at least haven't been taken seriously in an awfully long time. Is economic globalization really good for me? Our political leaders. Despite global growth, a divide persists. The World Bank lists the top seven of the most unequal countries in the world in Africa and the next three in Latin America. And the West is increasingly fraught with tensions, inflamed by statistics like this. The top 1% now earns 23% of all income in America. The disparity divides populations and is upending political systems. We'll work to lower the tax burden streamline rules and make life easier for Unemployment in South Africa is becoming an urgent problem with almost a third of the population out of work. The urgency is amplified by a technological revolution that could severely worsen the problem, as automation and AI are likely to make vast sections of the workforce obsolete. As the costs add up, governments, corporations, and individuals are all being asked what they will do to tilt the global economy in a more equitable direction. Economic system that allows billionaires is immoral. Perhaps the only clarity right now is that a problem this big requires solutions of an equal scale. Winnie, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, because you've been sounding the alarm about inequality for, for many years. Um, and uh, it's hard to 
go anywhere at Davos this week where you don't hear people expressing concern about equality. Is anyone doing anything about it, either government or, or uh, in the corporate sector? Are you, are you seeing any, any movement towards addressing it? You're right. It's, I'm delighted to be on this panel. You're right that they're talking about it now. <coughs> that does make me happy, but not happy enough. Because extreme inequality is really out of control. So talking about it isn't good enough. And it's bad for all of us. It's undermining our economies, fracturing our societies, fueling crime, fueling ill health. It's bad for everyone. But yet we just talk about it. I just want to tell you about this man I met, amazing person from Denmark, called uh, Salchi, Jaffa Salchi. He's a multimillionaire. He came from Iran. He's an immigrant. He said to me that he visited a friend of his in a Latin American country that I won't mention. And in that country, he met, he visited his friend in his very posh apartment, great views, beautiful place. But he said he had to go through three security checks and that there were bars across his windows. And he said to me, the people in that country live like they are in cages. He said, for me, here in Denmark, I pay high taxes, but all I have in front of my window are flowers. That's the difference. So we are seeing it's a result of <coughs> choices, political choices that governments have chosen to make. That's what our report talks about this year, that governments have chosen not, for example, to tax fairly, to get rich companies and rich people to pay their <coughs> fair share of taxes. And because they don't collect those taxes, they don't put enough money into health, education, and social protection of their people. So public services are crumbling as a result. So we don't want governments to come here to talk or business to talk. We want business to commit <coughs> to good tax behavior, not to dodge paying their fair share of taxes. We want governments to tax fairly. We show in our report that companies used, that the top income tax rates in 1970 were around 62%. It's been negotiated down by companies and rich people to now less than 38% in rich countries, 28% in developing countries. A lot of the taxes on wealth have been abolished in many countries. So we want the burden of taxation to be put on the rich, on companies, and there's space for that. The IMF says there's space for that. It won't undermine economic growth. And then we want the money plowed into services for people to be able to thrive, to be able to, to contribute in growth. Thank you. Uh, Jane, let's, uh, let's go back to basics. Um, your um, TED talk and, and a lot of your work is about what separates us from chimpanzees. Do our primate brothers and sisters gravitate toward inequality or equality? Is, is greed nature or nurture? Well, I think a lot of it is nature because, well, in chimpanzee society, the males are dominant uh, and the females are submissive. But on the other hand, the females live their own life and they raise their kids. Um, so, yes, a lot, a lot of the things that we have inherited uh, are from our ancient, probably a, a half ape, half human, you know, you know, ancestor, way back six million years ago ape-like, human-like, and so behavior that we share with them today is probably come with us along our long evolutionary pathways. But that's the difference. We are so like the chimpanzees that you can stand back and say, yeah, but what makes us different? The explosive development of our intellect. And I think that's partly triggered because we have this way of communicating with language so we can tell our children about things that aren't present. We can get together as we are here at Davos and discuss <coughs> problems and try and come up with solutions. Mm. Then the next thing we have to do is to take action. Mm. And, you know, from my perspective, I've been fighting to save the natural world. And that's become increasingly important as we all feel the 
the effects of climate change all around the world. I'm traveling 300 days a year all around the world. So I see the harm that we've inflicted on the natural world. And a lot of that is due to poverty. And this is where the inequality part comes in. So if you're living in a rural part of Africa uh, and you're out near the environment, you're going to cut down the last trees, even on the steep slope, even though you know it's going to cause erosion because you've got to grow food to feed your family or make charcoal. And, you know, it was when I realized what was happening in Africa that I knew that unless we do something to alleviate poverty, then there's no way we can hope to save chimpanzees or to save the forests upon which we all depend for clean water and clean air, as well as a spiritual connection to the natural world. Thank you. Alicia, um, you've studied the connection between inequality and, and growth are, um, and efficiency. Um, uh, striking, I, I think, that we've been in a period of fairly sustained growth around the world, um, certainly in many parts of the world, while also seeing so much rising inequality. What, what's the connection Perfect. there? How do they work together? Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes, we have been working on inequality for more than a decade. And the first thing we have to say is that equality is an irreductible ethical principle on the first place. Uh, so it's based on rights. And that's what the, the UN is about, rights. And the Agenda 2030 recognizes equality in the SDG 10 as, as a basic right for people. But secondly, is that equality is a prerequisite for development, mm -hmm. uh, not, not necessarily for growth. You can grow with inequality, but if you want to develop, that's a different, a different story. So, and, and what we have done is we are proving with numbers that there's no longer this big trade-off that existed in the economic thinking that either you had equality or efficiency, no. You can have equality, and if you don't have equality, economics will be inefficient. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are proving why is the new economics of inequality, in a way, that recognizes that inequality creates disincentives that are so relevant for the economy. For example, disincentives to complete education, disincentives to, to have health care in the crucial years of, of the cycle of life, uh, and how equality, productivity, and democracy come together. So the most, I would say, the most efficient economies of the world have a, a, the, the equality is embedded in the model of development. This is happening, for example, in the Nordic countries where you see that equality is there, you know, and, but it's also a, a economies that are very efficient because it, there is a, a positive correlation between productivity and equality. There's a positive correlation. We have made it mathematically in this document that we just produced that is the cost of inefficiency of inequality, where we are demonstrating that investment and inequality are also correlated. That in societies that are more unequal, investment goes lower. So, um, and, and the societal trust is not there to, 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 to be there. Now, in my region, in Latin America and the Caribbean, we are the most unequal region of the world. Even, even more unequal than sub-Sahara Africa as a region. So, um, and, but we are not the poorest region of the world. So poverty and equality are not the same thing. We, we have made a lot of uh, advances on poverty, but inequality is about the rich, not only about the poor. So we are measuring three forms of inequality. Inequality of income, income inequality, which is your salaries, your, what you get. We are also measuring distributional inequality, that is, what is the share of salaries versus the share of capital in GDP. And Latin America is in very bad shape. The share, when GDP grows, the share goes to capital and much less to salaries. And the third is uh, uh, income of wealth, um, um, uh, the distribution of wealth. And then let me put you three examples. We measure uh, wealth in three countries, Mexico, Chile, and Uruguay. And the genie of, of, of wealth 
in Mexico is 0 0.8, which means that 20% of the people in Mexico uh, concentrate the financial assets of the country. You know, concentrate, only 20% concentrate 80% of the financial assets. And in Uruguay, 30% out of 70, you, you must think that Uruguay is a very equal country. It is in terms of Gini for income, but not for wealth. Mm -hmm. And Chile is 0 0.78, which means again, that 20% of the population concentrate wealth. Now, do we have the instruments to redistribute? One instrument is the fiscal policies that Winnie is advocating, we are also advocating for paying taxes. And we are advocating for another thing, tax evasion. Mm. Tax evasion is the most critical form of the culture of privileges. Because equality and inequality is associated with the elite and the culture of privileges. That is, those who are exempted from taxes, those can elude taxes, those can elude law. So we call it the culture of privileges that naturalizes inequalities. So what are the instruments we have ahead of us? One of them is taxes. The second one is social uh, expenditure. And, and, and I would say that the, the future has to be uh, that equality strengthens democracy and strengthens uh, economics. And we can provide you with a study we have done where we show clearly what's the cost for society of not completing secondary school what, what would that become in terms of salaries in the future, in terms of digital inclusion, in, in, in terms of capabilities. And we also did the double cost of malnutrition and chronic nutrition and desnutrition. We did the calculations and you will find that if we don't invest on these critical points of society, we're gonna be in trouble. I'm gonna skip to Shamina just to jump off something you said. We are already um, in trouble. Uh, well, that, that this issue is not just about the state of the poor, but also the state of the rich. Um, there, a stat of the many, many on this topic that, that struck me is that by one measure, the ratio between a top CEO's pay and the pay of a typical worker has grown from 30 to 1 in 1978 to 312 to 1 today. Mm. Um, uh, Winnie, you have the, I'm sorry, uh, Shamina, you have the, the distinction of, of um, representing the entirety of the private sector around the world on this panel. Um, what is the problem, um, is the problem that's, that people at the top are paid too much or people at the bottom are paid too little? And, and what, what's the private sector, what can it do about that? What, it, what are you seeing done? Well, um, thanks for having me, and it's great to be on a panel with so many people that I admire. Um, I think I should start by saying that uh, I run something called this MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, which is a subsidiary of MasterCard um, that is, uh, whose remit is to uh, move from a place where MasterCard started on the financial inclusion space as a strategic objective um, to one that also includes inclusive growth that sort of says, like what we're talking about here, policy and government um, is an important part of the equation, but private sector and private sector resources are an enormously part, uh, important part of the uh, calculation as well. So we created something that allows us to use the assets of a company like MasterCard, technology, data, people, capital, um, and turn those to social impact. And what we found was there's actually not that much difference when you think about profitability and sustainability. The application may be different, but this idea that it takes technology and policy to make a difference, and they're both enablers, by the way. In the United States, I think money is green, whether you're a consumer or a taxpayer. And so people don't separate how they spend their money or why they spend their money. Um, and so what we're doing at the Center for Inclusive Growth is sort of saying, look, are there ways to integrate the motivations of a firm with the motivations of a government, with the motivations of a citizen to create equitable and sustainable long-term economic growth, what we call inclusive growth? Um, those are the conversations that we're having, and I think the conversations that we have to have in order to make sure that this conversation actually changes. And to Winnie's point, we actually do something about it instead of talk about it. Um, one thing I'll offer is that, um, and another section of the inequality that I think is 
in some respects, a contributor to income inequality, but in some respects, I would say sort of the canary in the coal mine that we haven't talked as much about is information inequality. When you bring technology into the equation, you start to see a world where the information haves and the information have-nots are getting further and further apart. What I'm specifically <coughs> talking about is data and the power of data. We've talked a lot about AI. We've talked a lot about machine learning these past couple of days. The gap between the people who understand AI, the people who understand machine learning, the people who understand how to use data is widening at a pace that I would argue could be more dangerous or is as dangerous as income inequality because then you're widening the capabilities of people to do something. Not necessarily enablers, but their capabilities. One of the things that we've been trying to do at the center and we launched here this week was in partnership with the Rockefeller Foundation. We've decided to um, gear resources, both technological and um, monetary resources, to try to capture the gap before it gets too far. Uh, we've created a data for social impact <coughs> collaborative that we're inviting other public sector entities and private sector entities to join, to commit to empowering the social sector and the government sector and the nonprofit sector with the capability to realize the power of what's here and what's coming with data and information. So I sort of offer that up as an actionable um, point of view that sort of says, look, I've, and I'll sort of end this piece by saying that I used to, I come out of the public sector. I worked in the, the White, House. White House. I've worked for the current Speaker of the House, in the United States right now. I've worked for a labor union. I've worked for nonprofits. Um, and I've kind of, and I think that it's this type of um, what I call, sort of call bridge building activity that sort of has made me realize that it's not sectors that are going to change anything or frankly do anything. It's the people within those sectors. And the more we have people who are operating with a sense of decency that are cross sector and who can have these types of conversation, I think we might be able to actually do something. And I'd like to talk uh, later about some partnerships that we have going with other people in private sector companies. Great. Um, uh, Rutger, let's talk about um, concrete steps to get people out of poverty, a subject you've written and thought a lot about. Um, I won't get the phrase exactly right, but it's, it's poverty is a lack of cash. Yeah, that's basically what it is. It's um, not a lack of character, <laughs> yeah, um, certainly. Uh, talk about the, the impact of uh, what happens when, when you <coughs> when you give people who need cash cash to pull themselves up is, is uh, and the universal base, the idea of a universal basic income. Sure, well, for some perspective, I, I mean, I must first say, this is my first time at Davos and, uh, and I find it quite a bewildering experience, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, 1,500 private yets have flown in here to hear Sir David Attenborough speak about, you know, how we're wrecking the planet. And uh, I mean, I hear people talk in the language of participation and justice and equality and transparency. But then, I mean, almost no one raises the real issue of tax avoidance, right? And of the rich just not paying their fair share. I mean, it feels like I'm at a firefighters fighters conference and no one's allowed to speak about water, right? <laughs> there, was, there was only one panel, actually. Thank well, we've had two. You're the second well, of well, our panelists. There, there so was only one panel. Let's go there. One. One panel hidden away in the media center that was actually about tax avoidance. Yeah. I, was about, I was one of the 15 participants. So <laughs> something needs to change here. I mean, ten, 10 years ago, the World Economic Forum asked the question, what must industry do to prevent a broad social backlash? The answer is very simple. Just stop talking about philanthropy and start talking about taxes, mm -hmm. taxes, taxes. We need to, mm -hmm. I mean, just two days ago, there was a billionaire in here, uh, what's his name, Michael Dell. And uh, he asked the question like, name me one country where a top marginal tax rate of 70% has actually worked. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm a historian, the United States, that's where it has actually worked. In the 1950s, during <laughs> Republican President Eisenhower, you know, the war veteran, the top marginal tax rate in the US was 91% mm -hmm. for people like Michael Dell. You know, the top estate tax for people like Michael Dell was more than 70%. I mean, this is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can talk for a very long time about all these stupid <laughs> philanthropy schemes. We can invite Bono once more, but come on, it's, we gotta be talking about taxes. Yeah, That's it, taxes, taxes, taxes. All the rest is bullshit, in, in my opinion. Thank you.
Go ahead. Radka is so right. The top <laughs> is last year alone, the wealth of billionaires was rising by $2.5 billion a day. And the wealth of the bottom half of humanity, 3.8 billion people, was declining, reducing by $500 million <coughs> a day. It's not difficult to see why. If you look at the business model, we work, Oxfam works with uh, garment workers in many of these Asian countries. Take Bangladesh. A woman who is stitching clothes for the clothes we, bear, the clothes we buy in HM, in Zara, in uh, the, the high street shops, earns $4 a day. <coughs> she is always in debt. When she gets sick, she's not paid. She works 20, 21 hours a day. When she's pregnant, she's fired. That's in Bangladesh. Then we also work with poultry workers in the richest country in the world, the United States. Poultry workers. These are women who are cutting the chickens and packing them, and we buy them in the supermarkets. Dolores, one woman we work with there, told us that she and her co-workers have to wear diapers to work because they are not allowed toilet breaks. This is in the richest country in the world. So there's a business model that is, continues to maximize <coughs> for shareholders and to cheat the ordinary people down the supply chains and to damage the environment, damage communities, and then not pay their fair share of taxes. The top executives of these companies are among the highest paid in the world. The, owner, the chief executive of Zara is one of the highest paid people in the world. So we have a business model that has, over the years, grown to maximize for a few owners of capital and to cheat everybody else. And the business people who run these businesses, on top of that, avoid paying their fair share of taxes have built loopholes across the tax system. We have a tax system that leaks so much that allows $170 billion of money every year to be taken to tax havens and to be denied the developing countries that need that money most. So we have to look at the business model, and we have to look at the role of governments to tax and plow back money into people's lives. Let's, let, Jane, let, let's go back to um, that explosion, the brain, that um, what, what is it, um, uh, uh, what's lacking in the brain that, you know, I think um, just mentioned a minute ago, Davos report 10 years ago, we've got to address this. Um, some of the solutions do seem rather obvious. Why can't we get there? What is it about us that we see, we see the solution and um, the urgency, but we can't get there? Well, you know, I find this whole thing about our intellect is fascinating. One, we're now beginning to understand that we're not the only beings on the planet with personalities, minds, and emotions, which I was taught when I went to Cambridge there was a difference between us and other animals that was one of kind. And now we realize it's one of degree. And animals are way more intelligent than we used to think, but it can't compare with a species that designed a rocket that went up to Mars, from which crawled a little robot taking photos, or the Chinese have put a rocket on the dark side of the moon. We've seen photographs of those planets. I, I don't want to go and live there personally, and um, I doubt if anybody here does. Uh, so, to answer your question, what's gone wrong? Ooh. How is it that the most intellectual creature that's ever walked on this planet, destroying its only home, mm -hmm. destroying the environment, mm -hmm. and causing all these inequalities in our societies, what's gone wrong? And I think that what's gone wrong, in, at least in my perspective, is that there has become a link uh, that there... It, Sorry, that we've broken the link between <coughs> intellect and wisdom. And if we think of wisdom as uh, love, compassion, and making decisions not based on 
how will this help me now? How will this help my bank account? How will it help the next shareholders meeting? How will it help my next political campaign? But how will this decision I make today affect future generations? That link seems to have been broken. And how do we, how do we address that? This is why I began a program for young people called Roots and Shoots that's now in nearly 80 countries around the world. And we bring together young people. We work with those from inner city. We work with the Native American reservation children. And if you want inequality, go to one of the reservations in the richest country in the world. If you want inequality, walk along some of the streets in the UK where the wealthy live and find homeless peoples sleeping on the street below. It's, it's everywhere. And so by bringing these young people together from all these different uh, areas of life and having them talk about it, and get to understand each other's problems and then work out ways of helping each other, that I'm beginning to see is making a difference. A quick follow-up. If, if uh, the answer is youth, do we have enough time for them to get older? Well, here, here's the thing. I began this program in 1991 uh, with high school students. That's where it began. It's now kindergarten, university, and everything in between. And so a lot of these students uh, are now out there in the world uh, taking up positions of leadership in different um, walks of life. And they are making a difference. They take the philosophy that they learned in Roots and Shoots. And you know, something that's, I think, very important in a discussion like this is we all need money to live. It goes wrong when we live for money, unless we're making money to make this a better world. And a question that I, I always want to ask economists, we always talk about you know, economic growth, uh, the development of GDP and so forth, which obviously we want everyone to have a good life. But if you take the wealthy today, you take human population growth, which nobody ever wants to talk about, but which is really key, how can we have unlimited economic development, even not counting the richest of the rich, but us uh, on a planet of finite natural resources? We have to alleviate poverty on the one hand, uh, reduce the unsustainable lifestyle of so many people on the other, and at least think about human population growth. Mm. And finally, to think that this natural world that we're destroying so fast, partly because of poverty, we need it for our own survival. I'm not just fighting because I care passionately about forests and chimpanzees and oceans and whales. I'm fighting because as we destroy the natural environment, we're destroying our own future, our own children and grandchildren. We all care about them, but we're not thinking about how what we do today is actually stealing their future. Intelligence versus wisdom. Alicia, um, how do we get from talking about it to doing something about it? Well, listen, <clears throat> I was listening very carefully to Jane. <clears throat> I think that we have, um, we have to change our paradigm uh, of development. And, and we definitely have to do that soon, quickly. And that was about Agenda 2030 wanted to do that. I don't know if we're going to accomplish that soon, but we definitely have to change the development paradigm. And we have to move to a more sustainable future in the sense of circular economy. We have to look for sources of energy outside of the planet. And that's why solar energy is so important, because we are not going to use the resources of this planet as we are doing now. We have to go for extraplanetary resources, I think. And then, of course, inequality is also uh, intergenerational inequality. We, are not, we, are, we say we think about future generations, but we are not applying the discount rate for present generations. We have to pay a price now to be able to preserve the future generations from climate change, from the destructions of key ecosystems of the world. Number two, let me say that when we talk about tax avoidance, I'm talking about something very concrete. Latin America and the Caribbean, 
the tax avoidance annually comes up to 350,000, 250 billion dollars a year. That's a lot of money. 6.7% mm -hmm. of the GDP of Latin America and the Caribbean is going out of the region through tax avoidance. 110 billion are going through illicit fund fl flows. Mm -hmm. And not narco traffic, no, 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 no. Is in the trade, in the trade customs where this is happening because we are not pricing right the exports and the imports. We are favoring imports versus exports. So we're losing $110 billion. So only if we get those two, those two amounts of money, we could be able to finance three things. One, a basic income for young people from 15 to 29, young people. We're talking about 145 million young people in my region that could need the basic income. We have calculated more or less how much would that cost, starting with the poorest of the poor and going up. We can pay for that. The cash transfers today that go for extreme poverty are costing 0.3% of GDP. 0.3, nothing. So we are asking governments, don't take out those programs because those programs like Bolsa Familia and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, were programs that took out of poverty 40 million people in the region, in Brazil, 70 million in the whole region. And then thirdly, we would like to apply a, a, a expenditure, social expenditure, on something that I think is very important, which is labor inclusion. Labor inclusion, which goes to capacity building of the current workers. Because we also think about the incoming workers, but what do we do with the Workers we have today, we have to uh, build capabilities on those. And then go to what you are doing, which is financial inclusion. That is, how do we link the cash transfers, the income, the basic income, with the bankarization? I don't know how you say that, but in, hmm. how do we put these people into the banking system and so they know how to handle their own money and so forth? But I think these are some concrete measures that should be taken. Hmm. Many of them come from the governments, of course. We need the support of the private sector. The private sector needs to have, again, this moral, moral um, how do you say, fiscal moral uh, contribution. And, and, and I think uh, this is something that we were talking about. I don't want them to pay 90% of taxes. I only want them to I pay do. the taxes. I mean, Michael Dell shoot. Just pay the taxes. <laughs> in, in Latin America, it's 18% of GDP. Just pay that. Um, Rucker, then, then we should open it up. Um, uh -huh. Uh, what, what, you're a historian, um, what would it take, and does history suggest it's possible, um, to make it so that, you know, five years from now when you fly back here on your private jet, um, <laughs> no, on a bus, on a perfect. bus, um, uh, rock across the Alps, um, yeah. uh, <laughs> something will, you know, we will have made some headway. Yeah, well, you know, the lessons of history are pretty depressing, to be honest. So the times that we've seen that we managed to reduce inequality radically, uh, you know, we're during times of war. It, it's, that's that's what, what's the most effective way. Now, I'm obviously not suggesting we should start a war here, uh, but what we do need is what the philosopher William James 100 years called the moral equivalent of war. And I believe that the challenge of climate change can be exactly that. So we need to realize that we are standing, you know, at, at, at a point in history as a species that we just don't have much time left. And what we need is a new Green Deal, I believe. Look at the experience of France. So what happened in France is that you had this whole yellow vest movement after, you know, a tax on petrol, if I'm correct. Um, and then the, an explosion of protests broke out. Um, a French CEO explained to me this week that actually the, the, the most important reason for all of these protests was the abolition of the wealth tax in France. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's not, it's, again, it's not rocket science. What we need are way higher taxes on, on the wealthy mm. um, so that we can actually fund this green transition to a much better planet. But, I mean, the, the, the scale of the challenge is so radical is that, again, we, we, it will never be solved by, by just the private sector alone or just by words alone or by philanthropy. We really need to start to realize that we, yeah, we need something like the moral equi equivalent of a war. Mm -hmm. Um, let's open it up. We have... I, 
start right here, and then I'll get over here. Hi, I'm uh, Isham Sabir. I'm a global shaper from uh, San Francisco, and I build uh, digital tools for the homeless community. Uh, I would just like to ask the global shapers in the room to stand up, maybe. Um, and so, oh, I didn't know there were so many. But my question is, um, to, in Davos, that was our first time in Davos. There were 49 of us today who are, I think, all of us committed to fighting inequality. In the world, it's more than 7,000 of us who are all professionals between, the year, between 20 and 30 years old. What is your ask to our generation and our group, and how do you think we could finally uh, put an end to inequality? Thank you. Wow. Mm -hmm. Let me Don't jump in here for a second, because as a YGL alum, as an OGL at this point, the <laughs> precursor to the publishers, <laughs> um, that was my entry into Davos. And so I think that um, it's, it's what I would sort of say is it's where I started, is that sectors alone aren't going to solve this. It's about the global shapers crossing sectors. It's about the YGLs crossing sectors and not recognizing whether you're private sector, public sector, citizen sector, or government, that you're in it for the right reason, to create human-centered design that really helps people. And if your resources are allocated because you have tax or don't have tax, or you have this or you don't have that, the, the values of how you're allocating your time and your resources need to be paramount. And to what Ms. Goodall said, I agree, that we do have the intellect. And if anybody knows this, Global Shapers know this that it's the intellect that we have, but it's about aligning the interests with your intellect, with your capabilities, with your resources across sectors to keep people at the center. And to involve mm. love and compassion. Yes. Oh. 100%. To link up our brain with our heart, because I truly believe only when head and heart work in harmony can we attain our true human potential. And you know, the other thing is, which I think fits into this discussion, as I'm traveling around the world, uh, which I hate, by the way, and I do not have a private jet. Uh, uh, some people say I should, and I say that would be the most awful thing I could do. Um, I, I meet amazing people. I keep encountering this indomitable human spirit, the people who tackle the impossible. The impossible, which you might say what we're talking about now seems impossible. And yet there are people who tackle it and go on fighting it and won't give up. And that indomitable human spirit is in every single one of us. Mm -hmm. And it's so important to realize when we're trying to solve problems that each and every one of us can make a difference. And each and every one of us on this planet, we do make an impact every single day. And we who have enough uh, financial ability we can choose what we do, what sort of impact we make. And these things are very important to remember. And it's also important to remember every individual matters. And of course, that includes animals who are so, also are individuals, but every individual has a role to play. Everybody makes a difference every day. And everybody, all of us, we all have this indomitable spirit. The poorest of the poor, I've encountered who just face up to the challenges. And I found that one of the biggest helps to reducing poverty and to empowering people is first of all through the youth, but also uh, we introduced to reduce poverty in our area, uh, microcredit based on Mohammed Yunus's Grameen Bank. So that rather than hand out money to poor people, you loan them money. And, they pay you back and they're proud, it's theirs. They're now empowered to go out and make a difference and encourage uh, those other people to also rise out of poverty by their own effort. Mm, Question over here, I think, yes. Um, uh, Ken Goldman from Silicon Valley. Um, I'm gonna make a couple of comments actually. Uh, I actually came, because I do believe we have an issue here, but I have to say, honestly, this is a very one-sided panel. Um, <laughs> it's extremely one-sided. I was surprised the way we, cre we created this panel. Well, By the, the way, conference Jane, is very one-sided. So. Can I talk, please? Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you like to use swear words, too. Um, Jane, thanks for, I saw you yesterday at lunch, too. It was, it was quite good. Um, and we make uh, comments with swear words, with anecdotes, and so forth. Um, and all I've heard about here is talking about taxes, I haven't seen anything in correlation of growth, which I'll come back to it again. 
And just a couple comments. Uh, today, the U.S. basically has the lowest unemployment rate ever, the lowest black unemployment rate ever, lowest youth unemployment ever. Uh, we've actually reduced poverty around the world. No one's talking about that at all. People have ne negated philanthropy. Just read a couple weeks ago the article on Bill Gates and what he's done in Africa and reducing malaria, reducing polio. So why, why don't we talk about that? Um, so really I have a question for the panel. Uh, and yes, I, I agree uh, tax avoidance is probably a big issue, probably a bigger issue than we think. Uh, but instead of taxes, what else do you, uh, instead of redistributing wealth, what are we talking about in terms of creating wealth? You know, frankly, what people really want, what really want is a dignity of a job. And we've given more jobs in the U.S. We've increased the minimum wage. Just look at California, with the minimum wage going to fifteen dollars, may not be a lot, but it's up from seven. So I'd like for the panel to talk about beyond taxes, which every one of you have talked about. The only thing you've talked about in this whole panel on inequality: mm -hmm. what can we really do to solve and help solve inequality over time beyond taxes? Can I answer? Well, let, Shamina, just yeah. since you're in the in the trenches on this, I think yeah. maybe I think we could start um, with you. Listen, I think there are a lot of points there, but I think I'd like to just point to two concrete examples of sort of how we're approaching, um, well, you know, income creation, job creation. And that's, and I'll give two private sector examples, because I think actually one of the, um, the areas that I'm seeing more and more of as people move from public to private, private to public, public to citizen sector, and start to integrate the sectors, is that there's a lot of private, private momentum. And I'll give you one example. In uh, Unilever, um, has uh, millions of supply chain of small shop owners uh, around the world that create that have to create wealth for their families and their communities. Most of these are women. Um, they buy and sell products in small shops. That behavior of buying and selling product is an enormous. Um, it it transcends something that Ms. Goodall again raised on microfinance is that. When you lend in microfinance, oftentimes your interest rate is 30% or 18% or 20. It's a really tough interest rate to have to pay back. And there is a cycle of debt in some of these markets. So what we were trying to do is say, look, can we take the buying and selling behavior of shop owners in the Unilever supply chain and use that as a proxy for credit, as a proxy for collateral, to allow them to borrow from banks, regulated banks, to uh, at rates that regular shops get, regular small businesses get, to allow them to buy and sell product, not what they can sell in a day, but what can the, they can sell in a week, and allow them to have the dignity to create wealth for themselves and their families. What we've seen in a very short period of time is that um, in a supply chain in Nairobi that has 40,000, we've, we've worked with about 16,000 um, uh, to work with Kenya Commercial Bank to say, that, are, that has decided to use proxy for credit score so that these shop owners can get regular loans. And what we've seen is in the marketplace a 30% increase on average in sales. And that may not sound like a lot, but to a small shop owner who has here today, been living on $4 a day or less, when you start to see wealth creation in that respect, you do start to see a difference in lives. And that's the sort of thing that I talk about when I think we've been hearing a lot about, or not talked a lot about, about proximity. And actually being proximate to some of these issues. I don't know, I know there's a lot of us who've been out in the field and been out in the trenches, but as somebody who's worked with nursing home workers on the front line in Detroit, Michigan, and seen the lives that they've had to live, and worked at the White House, and work for a corporation, I can tell you that wealth creation without wisdom, without some knowledge of keeping people at the center, is lost. And we will be lost. I think, Winnie, it gets back to a point that, uh, a question from earlier, which is um, there is this paradox. Um, um, tremendous growth in many parts of the world. Um, many people, I mean, China's an example, you know, millions of people um, lifted into the middle class, um, and yet inequality has been growing. You know, how do you reconcile um, growth and, and, and inequality at once? Okay. I think it also depends on what you're counting. The World Bank tells us that with this rate of inequality, extreme inequality, that we will not be able to eliminate, to eradicate poverty, extreme pro poverty by 2030, as has been promised, unless that inequality is reduced. 
Alicia has told us that this correlation between inequality and, or rather equality and efficiency has now been disproved, that you actually achieve sustained growth when you reduce inequality and the other way around. So we need to now <coughs> debunk the myths that you need first to achieve high growth before you can reduce inequality. That actually when you reduce inequality, you can achieve more sustained and faster growth. That's one. Two, we are, we are talk, we, we're not just talking about taxes, but taxes are important. Yes, we're talking about corporate taxes, income tax, inheritance tax, capital gains tax, all these wealth taxes being reduced and reduced and reduced to a point where they've been abolished in some countries. We need to get fair taxation. Bill Gates himself says the most important responsibility of a rich person is to pay their fair share of taxes. So that's, we can't avoid talking about that. But we also talk about tax evasion, the loopholes. We are in a digital economy, but the tax system is from the 1920s. It's full of loopholes that don't allow revenues to be collected. And what happens when you don't collect them? Then you don't put money into people's health and education and you widen inequalities. The gentleman who talked about, who said we've just talked taxes and that jobs are there and there's low and unemployment rates are low. Let me tell you something. We're talking about jobs, but the quality of those jobs. I've just told you about Dolores in the United States who wears a diaper to work. That's not a dignified job. I can tell you about a company I went, I, I took a taxi in Nairobi recently and I was charged, the minimum charge I think would be that. I was charged less than $2 for a taxi ride. Where in the world do you go in a taxi for less than $2? I asked the taxi driver, he was from one of these companies, I won't mention which. I said, how much are you getting out of this? He said 20% must go to the global company that owns the network. So I said, then what about the rest? He said, the rest I have to share with the owner of the taxi, out of $2. I asked him where he rents his home, where he lives. He said, they rent a room, three taxi drivers. They sleep in turns, six hours, five hours, because they can't, none of them can afford to rent a room. That's the job. Those are the jobs we are being told about, that globalization is bringing jobs. The quality of the jobs matter. It matters. These are not jobs of dignity. In many countries, workers no longer have a, a voice. They are not allowed to unionize. They are not allowed to negotiate for, for salaries. So we're talking about jobs, but jobs that bring dignity. We are talking about healthcare. The World Bank has told us that 3.4 billion people who earn $5.5 a day are on the verge, are just a medical bill away from sinking into poverty. They don't have health care. They are just a crop failure away from sinking back into poverty. They have no crop insurance. So don't tell me about low levels of unemployment. You are counting the wrong things. You're not counting dignity of people. You're counting exploited people. I, I want I want to ask Rutger one quick question and then I go to you. Um, um, just turning it to politics, because I, you know, the, the, the data are, are complex about whether and where growth is raising wages uh, for the poorest in, in the world. Um, by some measures, wages are going up, but so is cost of living. I mean, what isn't in doubt is that the, the reality and perception of inequality is driving incredible political upheaval. I mean, it's you know, remarkable to me this year at Davos uh, how many of the world leaders, you know, we're talking about shaping global architecture, the principal architects are, are um, um, locked in their basements. You know, so many of the world leaders are back at home dealing with the upheaval caused by the topic we're talking about today. And Rucker, I just wanted your historical perspective on um, how, how, that, how that plays out 
Mm. You know, we, we can debate the, the data, um, but the reality is the, that we have a political world that is um, under siege. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me give you both a historical and a personal perspective. You know, I was born in 1988, so that was one year before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I grew up in the 90s when people believed that, you know, we had arrived at the end of history and that all that was left to solve was, you know, climate change and maybe a bit poverty. We'll talk a little bit about inequality, but that's it. We, you know, we were all liberal Democrats and, and the rest of the world was, was supposed to follow. Then we had the financial crash in 2008. Now we've seen the rise of populists around the globe, right? Trump, Bolsonaro, uh, we've seen Brexit. And what gives me great hope right now is that there's a new generation that is actually waking up is actually waking up, you know, that it doesn't believe the myth anymore, that the vast inequality we see today is just the force of nature, you know, an inevitable <laughs> consequence of, of globalization or technology. There's a new generation that just doesn't believe it anymore, mm -hmm. that sees that most, most of the wealth that's, you know, that's being uh, possessed by, by many of the participants here has not been earned through hard work, but been extracted so. from workers who are doing the real work, mm -hmm. but not being paid a living wage. Mm -hmm. So that, that is what really gives me hope. And that's, I think, what all these movements are about. It's about people waking up and realizing that they've been sold a lie. That's what's happening. Your question. Um, I think the, yeah, we go to you next. Alakash, I'm a writer. <clears throat> Alakash, I'm a writer. Um, basic income was briefly mentioned. Could I invite the participants to discuss that in greater detail and specifically address the biggest disadvantages as well as advantages I suppose a more succinct paraphrase of my question would be, what is the cost of equality? Mm -hmm. Alicia, you want to yes, tackle that? And thank you for the question. I think that the cost of equality would be to have education up to, th <coughs> to tertiary education for all. Mm -hmm. That's one cost. We have costed it out. Uh, secondly, to have uh, universal access to health. Mm -hmm. which you have in developed countries. In developing countries, we don't. Uh, nutrition and malnutrition, the two, the chronic and, and, and desnutrition should be there in the first years of a young child. That's cost of equality for the future, by the way. And then the, the third thing is la uh, labor inclusion. I mean, I understand that we can not only talk about taxes, we also need to talk about jobs exactly. and decent jobs. And decent jobs means to earn at least above the poverty line, mm -hmm. at least. But we have to say that at least in Latin America, 47% of the workers are informal and do not earn above the poverty line. The poverty line means that you get your basic needs covered. Mm -hmm. So for me, the cost of equality in is to, to, to raise the basic income of people up to the poverty line. That is to, to make sure that they can go further. So th that is costed already. We, we have the economics of that. But let me also address the, the global shapers, because I was also a global leader of tomorrow, it was called. Of course, we are the global leaders of yesterday, <laughs> and we are no longer the startups, but the end ups. But anyway, but five things. I would say, think about the new development paradigm. Think about it closely. We need a new development paradigm new patterns of consumption and production. And the companies that are in Davos, basically the companies in Davos are the ones who are thinking very profoundly on changes on consumption and, and production patterns. I don't see th that happening in the regions. The companies that have their jurisdictions in my region do not think about this, the men and women who are representing Unilever, for example. I think Unilever has a lot of clarity here but I want him, Paul Mann, to come to my region and talk to his Unilever people. Anyway, but you see what I mean? But the thing is, we have to change the production and consumption patterns. We have to protect the integrity of ecosystems, of the few ecosystems we have left. The, the integrity is not to protect one plant or one tree or one, no, 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 the, the ecosystem itself. Each country will have to define which ecosystems are critical for that country. Thirdly, oceans, plastic. Let's get rid of plastic. Uh, fourth, I would say, ask about, uh, for example, there are companies here in Davos that are doing the Electric Battery Alliance, which I am part of. I believe on electric mobility. I believe they are going the right way. But not to produce 
ask about the process because they are using cobalt. Cobalt is being produced in DRC with, uh, with child labor. So let's look at the process besides the outcomes and be compassion, solidarity, and equality. Um, it says time out on this screen, <laughs> alas. Um, thank you all for coming. Thanks to the panelists and Mr. H um, uh, in particular. Um, see you. Thank you.